Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hearing. In 2014, GN Resound launched the first made-for-iPhone hearing aids. Impressively, that's actually a year before the first true wireless earbuds began shipping, and meant to address the shortcomings of Bluetooth Classic that made it unacceptable in the hearing aid application. The ability to direct stream to hearing aids was a game-changer I can personally attest to because of our increasingly connected world but the resultant proliferation of proprietary connection schemes created its own problems for both hearing care professionals and end users. The hearing aid manufacturers were not happy with this situation either, and as a result, they urged a Bluetooth Special Interest Group, or SIG, to develop a new version of Bluetooth that would work with hearing aids and earbuds alike. The result was LE Audio and Oracast. It may seem like forever, but the rollout of LE Audio has now begun in earnest, including with GN Resound's recent launch of their Nexia hearing aid platform. Here to tell us more about Nexia and the advantages that LE Audio and Oracast will bring to hearing aid users is Laura Christensen, Chief Audiology Officer at GN Hearing. Laura, welcome to the show. Please tell everyone a little bit about your background and your role at GN. Well, first I'll say thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and I loved your introduction. Uh, been a part of all of those things that, that you introduced there. Uh, so I have, uh, I've been at GN for uh, 20, almost 21 years now, going, going on 21 years. Uh, and I've been in various roles. When I first started, I, I started as um, the head of research in the United States um, when we were just creating a, a research division in the United States. And Several years later, I took over audiology, um, both in Glenview, Illinois, where we have about a third of our R&D, and in Copenhagen. Uh, and so I, I've had audiology then kind of the rest of the time. I've been in and out of uh, doing the audiology and marketing. Uh, right now, I run training and education. Uh, but what I've always done is been audiology or ran the audiology team uh, in R&D. So doing clinical trials, all of the regulatory work, um, you know, being part of product development, that is, that has always been my passion, uh, is to actually be in product development. So uh, my background, uh, you know, I, I have my PhD uh, from Indiana University, and, and then my first job was at LSU Medical Center in New Orleans. So I had their, uh, you know, the the great opportunity to work with the likes of uh, Linda Hood and and Chuck Berlin and be part of Kresge. And and I stayed there uh, until I was a tenured professor. And then I got an opportunity to work with Mead Killian at uh, Edemotic Research. And it was those days at Edemotic that, that made me say, you know, I really want to be in product development. I don't, I don't want to be in a university looking at hearing aids. After they're launched, I want to be there you know when they're when they're being launched and when they're being tested and defined and and so I stayed at Anemotic uh, for about five years, but I, I came to GN again 21 years ago and have a look back. I uh, love being part of hearing aid development teams. It's quite the background, and I remain amazed. I I met Mead Killian when I first started working with my now former employer Knowles, and I am. Um, Still amazed at how many people he's touched over the years. It 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 is truly amazing. Um, I I learned so much about product development from him. Uh, you know, over the years that I was there, and you know, I I think you know you could do a whole segment on mentors, but I I think I had some of the best mentors there is. I Larry Humes was my mentor at Indiana University, so started out very well, and then uh, Chuck Berlin. Uh, Linda Hood, uh, Bob Turner at LSU Medical Center, and then and then ultimately meet Jillian, and and then I've had great business mentors even in in uh, in GN hearing. So yeah, I've been lucky. I think uh, I think you know having the opportunity to learn from other people and to surround yourself, you know, with people who are better than you are at things and to learn from them. I, you know, that's always been you know, how I think about hiring people. You know, I, when I when I hire people, you know, I, I want to hire people who'll challenge me, who are, you know, better than I am, who who can know more. You know, you you hire some of these young kids, and it's like, whoa, these guys are are passionate and and charged up, and they they want to go and they want to know everything, and that's how you keep sharp. 
Well, that's a terrific background, and I really appreciate you sharing it with me and with everybody listening. Uh, so let's get to the next year. Um, the announcement really highlighted the platform's LE audio and Oracast capabilities. Now, that picked my interest as both an industry professional and a hearing aid wearer who's been living a connected lifestyle, really, for most of my adult life. Uh, so I think a great place to start would be to share how GN sees the value of connectivity in general that made it worth investing significant resources over the last 10 years or more. Now, well, you know, you uh, you started the podcast by introducing, uh, you know, the value of connectivity that we've seen for a long time. You know, we were the first company that, that put 2.4 gigahertz into a hearing aid. And, and got a lot of criticism for it. You know, you, oh, you won't be able to do it. You won't be able to do ear to ear. You won't be able to do the things you need to do. But, you know, we have some incredible engineers that are still with the company today that that said, this is the future. You've got to be on 2.4 gigahertz. And and I think, you know, you you point out that this connected world is incredibly important. You know, at, at that time, you had some something around your neck and and you had to stream with that around your neck and people just weren't going to do that. And and so connectivity has been really important, but you also, it, it's it been a little chaotic, I think, as as you look at how it's progressed because you, you had companies like ours that came out with proprietary 2.4 gigahertz protocols and, and, and then you had Apple come out with, um, you know, an MFI, uh, type of audio protocol, and and then you saw Asha come out, um, which is Android streaming for hearing aids, and you know you have of course Bluetooth, the the regular standard Bluetooth that was introduced to the market, I think around 1999, and only one hearing aid company chose to put Bluetooth uh, in their hearing aids, and and the reason for that is that. You know, all of the rest of the companies, you know, every company, not just, uh, not just, uh, you know, all of the rest, but every company um, was already starting to think we needed to do something together um, and we needed to do something, you know, that everybody would be on the same wireless protocol and frequency because, you know, being able to be helped by assistive devices um, you know, teleloops are are very popular, and people who use them swear by them because they do make a huge difference in public situations. And and to have everybody on one frequency has always been this kind of dream that you could put one transmitter in a public space and and everyone could connect to that transmitter. And so, you know, the importance of connectivity has always been you know in the back of all of this. You know, all of the engineers' minds, AHIMA, the, the European Hearing Aid. Um, association was really the charge uh, to make it all happen. And and in 2013, they approached uh, Bluetooth SIG, which is the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, and and asked for a hearing aid protocol. You know, they asked for a protocol that would be low energy, um, really high quality, uh, even, even for, you know, a low latency, which is what we need. So we needed, a, you know, low power, low latency, high quality, and something that would do public broadcasting. And so, you know, it's been 10 years since that request. And and I think we, uh, the, uh, ultimately the request was accepted. And, um, you know, as your, as your listeners will hear, it's going to impact everyone's lives, not just uh, the hearing impaired uh, person's life. So it, it's a huge deal. We expected it to be out a little bit earlier, but uh, it had delays, and then the pandemic hit. And but I we're on the forefront of uh, all of the Bluetooth low energy audio and Orcast uh, hitting the market as we speak. Okay, okay, thanks for that uh, background. And and I will add, as a person, I've only been wearing about five years, but I, mean, I, I introduced uh, internet meetings to my then company in the nineties, so been doing this for a long time and I've come to appreciate the value of being able to hear well even before I was hearing impaired I made sure I had a good system so I could hear clearly when having an internet meeting and so on and I think that's sometimes understated how important it is that if you're doing a lot of internet meetings or otherwise listening connected um, the fatigue factor that goes without being able to hear properly 
really has an effect on your well-being and, and it can have an effect on your career as well. And so for that reason, connectivity has always been, i seen one of the, actually almost as key as the core functions of hearing aids for a person who spends half their work life on internet meetings and half their work life in, in person, then the ability to hear where, well in both situations is equally important. But you actually brought up something, you alluded to it, uh, the problems with Bluetooth Classic versus LE Audio. We'll leave Oracast aside for the moment and just talk about LE Audio and why LE Audio is necessary for the best connectivity experience in hearing aids. Yeah, well, so, you know, LE Audio, what they've done is is be able to make, you know, a, a really high quality audio and and even if it is compressed or you know even if it's compressed to send it faster the the sound quality stays incredibly good if if you cr- compressed bluetooth before uh the sound quality would just really degrade and and we had to do those kinds of things because it takes too long to send if you if you don't do those so now we're going to have you know very fast latencies with no degradation in sound quality whatsoever so so it sounds really good you know, I, I, I was going to I was going to pick up on, on something you said, you know, you can't have a conversation about hearing aids, it seems like, without talking a little bit about market track. But, you know, market track 22 listed the uh, hearing aid features that are most important to users. And, and what was pretty interesting in that list is that being able to control an app and stream, I think we're number three and four. Um only after like a volume control and and I can't remember what the the, what the other one was, but I mean it had to be speech and noise. <laughs> you know, it wasn't actually. It was something more tangible. It was something more that people could see um, in terms of a feature because we were asked. I think Market Track was asking about features, but you know, I thought it was incredibly interesting. And and a colleague of mine, um, well, two colleagues of mine, Jennifer Growth and, and Dan McCoy, they actually sent out surveys to. 25,000 hearing aid users and got responses back from 10,000 um, and looked at streaming and what are people, how, how do you see this sound quality streaming? And it was surprisingly high. Um, more than 90% felt their streaming sound quality was good. And when you looked at that, even by how they were fit, um, even open fitting thought their sound quality was good. But, but when you looked at it by what they were using they're streaming for, it made complete sense. I mean, the vast majority of people were streaming conversations like this or phone, you know, direct phone conversations, FaceTime calls, you know, those kinds of things that are not, you know, the typical hearing aid user is not streaming music all day. And I think sometimes we get a little, you know, we get a little backed up in, in maybe the sound quality could be better, but the sound quality is it hasn't been too bad and we're even going to make a big jump. Uh, like you say, in sound quality. So, you know, I think that I think that that's fantastic, and and it's just part of this uh, new Bluetooth low energy audio. Yeah, and so there's two things about uh, LE audio or low energy audio, which I think are worth pointing out. One is the low energy part, um, simply because Bluetooth Classic is pretty power hungry, which means you pay a penalty in hearing aid size, especially in rechargeables, yep. uh, to have all to support all day battery life. Uh, but the other is the latency, and I think actually for the audience, it's probably worth explaining what latency is and why having as little latency as possible is important. It, you know, and go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a, <laughs> no, I'm the one who asked the questions here. <laughs> How do you see it? I think you're probably a great person to do it. Okay, well, the, the, fine. I, I was actually. I was actually quite willing to hear how, how you view it from the standpoint of one of the major hearing aid manufacturers. But for me as a user, it's really all about the synchronization with lip movements for people who are, for example, watching movies and rely on lip reading cues as part of their comprehension and understanding. So if you're just streaming spoken word audio, and I completely agree with you, I listen to podcasts through my hearing aids all the time. And spoken word audio, you know, the audibility is brilliant. Music, no. If I'm listening to music, I pop in my earbuds. 
with some equalization dialed in that account for my hearing loss, but spoken word audio is perfect. Uh, even listening, if I do occasionally listen to music, you don't care about latency because there's no video to go with it. But if you're watching a movie, you want the audio to be synchronized as closely as possible with the lip movements. So you get that combination of lip reading cues and the audio at the same time. It's important also for the exact same reason for open hearing aids. You know, if you're streaming and have something coming into your ears at the same time, um, you you want these things to to happen quickly, and you know you want you want to be able to get things there quickly. And unfortunately, to do that with standard Bluetooth, we've had to compress, it. and and compressing it actually will decrease the sound quality dramatically. Uh, and now with the new codec. Um, which is really just the, the new software, the new the new uh, streaming software from Bluetooth. You can compress and have a really, really fast transmission with no degradation in sound quality whatsoever. And so, you know, that's huge for us as uh, hearing aid companies. That we we have in our app as we as we come out with uh, this Nexia device, you'll be able to actually. Um, change the, to you'll be able to change latencies and things in your app so that you can sync up the voice and uh, audio or, or lip sync and audio. So it, it, we actually are very, you know, it, we're, we have a TV streamer coming out with this and you'll be able to control all of that because it is very annoying. Any normal hearing person will tell you it's incredibly annoying when it somehow gets unsynced by, you know, the TV or, or by the channel. And, and, you know, hearing impaired people have had to deal with that, you know, a lot more. And so the ability to control it is, is something, but the ability to have it come quick enough that you don't have any problems and, and don't have any distortion is, is just incredible with this new Bluetooth standard. There's so much to unpack there, actually, that's part of the, you know, the user experience with hearing aids. And, and a key one is actually that mixed reality audio. Because, for example, when I watch TV and use the TV streamer, I'm going about 50% TV and 50% ambient. So that way I can still get the benefit of the TV audio being corrected in my hearing aids, but I can talk to the people in the room with me. Yeah. And if you do that, the latency has to be very, very low or else it's going to sound way too echoey or reverberant. And the same thing's true if you use a remote microphone. The latency has to be very low because you're going to get half real audio and half remote microphone audio. You cannot have a lot of uh, deviation there. No. And the adjustable latency is a very interesting thing because uh, I don't know how many people think about this, but sound is slow. And so, for example, if I'm watching in my living room, I'm about, say, three meters away from the television set. If I remember right... That's about 10 milliseconds of audio delay right there. If you're farther away, like in a public place, the speakers in the auditorium, the sound from them are going to get to you with a fair amount of delay. So if you actually have, it's actually interesting doing this. We went to a concert in Wrigley Field in Chicago, Bruce Springsteen, and we were the the concert is in the outfield and we're behind home plate so you know we're something like 100 meters away from the speakers and you could actually see looking at the big screen and the audio coming a sizable fraction of a second delay and so if you're going to be in an auditorium using orcas which we'll get to you have to be able to manage that delay just to account for the natural delay of the speaker audio getting to your ears. It's actually the opposite where the latency might be too low. Yep. And so the fact that you're building a latency adjustment in the app is brilliant. Yeah. And and we've actually had we've had uh, end users ask for something like that for some time. Um uh, and and with Oracast it's something we can do. So and you know it'll be in there now and it'll be nice for people, you know, to to control, you know, with the app, you know, you, you mentioned the power and, and I was just going to go back to that. I mean, I think, I think, you know, you have to be really smart. Everything you put in a hearing, it takes a certain amount of power. And, and, you know, a lot of hearing aid companies made the decision to stay away from standard Bluetooth because ultimately so much of your power was going to be 
used in streaming that you're compromising, you know, what you're doing in the hearing aid as well. You know, your battery life goes down so much, but you even have to compromise what algorithms you're going to use and and how you're going to use them. Just because, you know, you've got to look at power across the whole hearing aid and, you know, you, you want the streaming to be good, but you also want the hearing aid to be exceptional. And, and, and I think that's why many hearing aid companies, you know, took the decision that, hey, we're going to wait for Bluetooth low energy audio um, because that's the right amount of power we should be spending and, and, and leave the rest of the power to the hearing aid and such. So, you know, I, a lot of us waited and had to wait a long time. Uh, so, <laughs> So it's really exciting, you know, to have it coming out. I I was in California last week at the California Academy of Audiology, and and I gave a, a talk there to a, a really large crowd, um, you know, on the order of probably three hundred people. Uh, and and I asked, you know, how many of you have heard of Bluetooth Low Energy Audio and Auracast? And and about five hands went up. So. There is a ton of education to do. People are like, what is this Bluetooth low energy audio? Why do we have it? What, what is it going to replace? Um, I, I think the vast majority of audiologists out there um, don't know it's coming. Uh, don't know it's on the horizon. And, and I think that, you know, it's something, you know, obviously your podcast will help with uh, there. But I think more and more people, you know, are, are going to need to get, get, get the whole education like you're giving them today about, you know, what is this Bluetooth low energy audio and, and what is it going to be used for? So. No, I completely agree. And and because of it, I've actually been called upon a few times to help explain it as well. Uh, shameless plug for the 10 minute presentation I did for the computational audiology conference a couple of months ago, uh, which is now on their website. I'll put links into the show note where I gave a, a brief description of both LA audio and Oracast and what it means uh, for hearing impaired people, and I'll actually be doing a longer version of that at the Academy of Doctors of Audiology Audacity Conference coming up next month. Uh, and that one will be interesting because there have been so many announcements, including Nexia's, but also from people like Intel and Samsung, that even though it seems like we've been talking about this, you know, forever, um, things are now starting to happen. And LE Audio, I think, makes sense. Lower power, lower latency. It's a version of Bluetooth. I think one of the key advantages will also be there for hearing care professionals who don't have to navigate all the proprietary systems anymore. And it will also open up innovation because if somebody does something, you know, invents a better mousetrap and remote microphones, they will work with all the hearing aid brands once all hearing aids are supporting LE Audio and Oracast. Yep. Uh, so let's actually go to Oracast. I think we've been talking around Oracast, but I think it's worth describing what Oracast actually is. Uh, uh, please, how do, how do you see Oracast from your point of view? Describe it. So Oracast is part of this Bluetooth uh, low energy audio release, um, but it's a public broadcast. So it'll ultimately be, uh, you'll be able to identify a transmission um, with an assistant and, and then, and, to make this really easy, just like you would go uh, into, let's say, Starbucks and look for their uh, Wi-Fi network, you will be able to go into public spaces with your phone and and you'll be able to look for Oracast networks. And, and so you'll find your Oracast network and you connect to that. And as long as you have anything in your ears that is Bluetooth low energy audio, you will be able to stream directly that or cast network. So this takes you, you know, this is not just for hearing aid users. It's not just for cochlear implant users. This is for anyone who's using headphones or earbuds. You know, anything that you have in your ears, you'll be able to identify these public streams, these public or cast streams, and, and have them come, you know, directly to your uh, you know, directly to your hearing aids, you know, that's of course what we cared most about, but it's, it's also going to be used for, for people with, uh, normal hearing. And, you know, I find that to be, I, I find that to be incredible because think about that is little hearing industry. And we are very small, you know, approached the Bluetooth special interest group, which is a mammoth and said, Hey, we really, we would really like this just for our industry, just for, just for hearing impaired people, because this is incredibly important. 
And, and now it is becoming a new Bluetooth standard for all. So everyone will be able to do this. So, you know, think about, uh, think about some of the situations like, you know, I, I, I have a daughter who's at, uh, the university of Colorado right now, and it's really fun to watch a uh, CU football with Deion, Deion Sanders these days. Um, it has become this, the biggest thing. So I was in Nashville, uh, the other day because I have another child at Belmont university in Nashville and I was there for parents weekend, but I wanted to watch the CU football game. So I go to a bar. Everybody is screaming. It is loud. The CU football game is on, but I, you know, I can't hear the audio of it. And you will be able to, you know, have an Oracast network coming from that TV right to your, you know, your, your job or an ant, your AirPods, whatever you're wearing, you will have, you will have something that will stream right to, uh, you know, right to you. So in that situation, think about exercising in a gym where you might have 10 different TVs on different channels. You can go up with a QR code and just, you know, scan it with a QR code and and you'll be you'll be directly streaming that or cast stream to your hearing aids or or to your earphones. So it's it is amazing what it will do for public. You, know, you put it in a church, you put it in, you know, a courtroom, you put it wherever, wherever you want to go, it is, you know, very small. These these transmitters, the one we're putting out is absolutely tiny. It's smaller than the post-it note. Um so you'll have these transmitters that are you know, very small and they, and they can transmit, you know, think about how you do Wi-Fi in your house. You might have a, a main Wi-Fi network and then you might have some ancillary ones to make sure that the Wi-Fi is everywhere, very strong. You'll be able to do this in public places. Airports will have Oracast. You know, everyone will be able to do this, not just people with hearing loss. So this is, this is game changing for everyone. Um, and and I think that that's just remarkable, given that it started with the with the hearing industry. And you know, one thing I I would also just mention goes back just a little bit more. But you know, we've had problems with um, different different uh, phones. So you, you had to have MFI. You even alluded to this. You had to have MFI for one, and you have to have ASHA for Android phones. Um, as soon as you have phones with Bluetooth low energy audio and hearing aids with Bluetooth low energy audio. And everything's hand free. Every single phone doesn't matter which Android phone. You know, right now we we have lists of phones that are compatible and lists of phones that aren't compatible. Um, as the phones now have Bluetooth low energy audio, and you'll have that. And there, there's actually the the Samsung S23 already has low energy audio. Uh, the Samsung Flip, I think it's called, I don't know, Z5 or something like that, and Z4 that has low energy audio. The latest Pixel phone from Google has low energy audio. So it's not well advertised because there are not a lot of devices that pick up low energy audio today and there are no assistance. So in the phone where you would pick up you know, your Wi-Fi network, where you'd pick up your Oracast network, that doesn't exist in a phone today. Um, so we're just waiting for those things to come and and they're coming, they're coming very quickly. Uh, we'll see some demonstrations um, at the European uh, Hearing Aid Cong Congress in Germany next month of, of how all of this will work. And 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 we need to all be ready for the future and, and be future-proof with these hearing aids. Yeah, well, and future-proof is, is, is a question I had in mind because if I understand correctly, actually, I should back up a little bit because one thing uh, about Oracast, which is different than hearing loops, is that you can have multiple channels running at the same time. You can only have one hearing loop in a facility. Fine for, say, a house of worship. Uh, not so good for a sports bar when you have 10 TVs going. You could only have a loop for one of them. Uh, and so the multi-channel nature of Oracast makes it really interesting. And yes, it was very much the tail wagging the dog. Uh, what, 20 million hearing aids being shipped annually? So 10 million people being served? Well, there are between three and 400 million true wireless earbuds shipped every year. And yet the hearing aid industry drove this, but because everybody will be able to use it, I think you'll see many, many more installations of Oracast than you ever would see with hearing loops because of all the other applications that can now be served. But by that same token, just as you used the sports bar example, I think the first Oracast transmissions, and tell me if you agree, the first Oracast transmissions are going to be in mass consumer locations. 
In other words, a house of worship is not going to rip out their loop and put in Oracast tomorrow, but sports bars may start broadcasting it tomorrow. And because there's a lot more value when you can tell every patron of the bar, my advantage over the other one down the street is you can listen to all the games. Yeah. But that implies a very long transition period where both hearing loops and Oracast will exist side by side. And in fact, hearing loops, you know, that even today I would tell somebody if they're considering putting in a hearing loop in a public place, single channel public place like a theater or house of worship, by all means do it. You're going to serve your clientele with hearing impairment for a long, long time. So then when it comes to the hearing aids, I was, you know, digging into the Nexia, it looks like you have a model that will have both a telecoil and Oracast. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and I do agree with you um, that these things will coexist and can, can easily coexist. Uh, you could put the Oracast in a house of worship and have a loop. Um, so these things can coexist together easily. Uh, we do have, uh, in the Nexia, we'll have a receiver in the ear model that does have, uh, it's a size 13 battery with a telecoil in it. But our spouse mic has a telecoil in it. Um, so as long as you have a spouse mic, our multi mic, um, you always have a telecoil. Uh, so, the, you know, it, it doesn't matter what hearing aid you have, you would, you would always have a telecoil. So, we, you know, we've always believed that, you know, you get the smallest hearing aid you want. Don't worry about having a telecoil in there. Just make sure you have your, uh, your multi mic with you and you always have a telecoil. So, and we, we believe that it will coexist just like you say. Um, I think I believe it's going to happen a little bit faster than you do. Uh, you know, I, I think you're seeing it, it, we're already seeing it from a GN perspective faster than we thought with Samsung already telling, you know, recent TV buyers that they will get a firmware update to update their TVs to Orcast. And then they're starting to sell, you know, everything that will have Orcast. You know, I, I've seen some statistics, believe, you know, believe them or not, or, but, you know, 3 billion Orcast devices or Oracast, you know, transmitters out there uh, by 2030 and and by 2027, you know, two and a half billion LE audio devices out there. So you you already are going to start seeing them shipped. You know, the new Apple AirPods are low energy audio. So you you have you know you already have earbuds coming out with them, and and I think you're you know you've got phones coming out with them, and you're just going to see more as the rest of this year goes on, and as you get six months into 2024. You know, most people are going to know what Orcast is. No, most people are going to know what Bluetooth Low Energy Audio is. It's just going to be, I think, a very quick pickup. And then I think people are going to go, "Wow, I need my stuff to be equipped with uh, with low energy audio," and and people will be looking for that. So I, I do think it's going to going to happen pretty quickly. Uh, and and I think you know, obviously, we're excited to to be here. You know, in in this situation. We put out Omnia not that long ago. You know, we we put out Omnia, and Omnia was the culmination of the fifteen years of work that we had done in hearing and noise, and and we even took some choices around there. You know, do you do you really kind of finish all this hearing and noise and 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 wait on on Orcast? And and we did. Um, we went ahead and put Omnia out, and then really focused uh, with Nexia to get Orcast and and Bluetooth. Um, low energy equipped in there and and a few other things we'll talk about in Nexia as well. But but we wanted to make sure that you know we had we'd done both of those things and and we have, you know, I have a lot of customers right now saying, geez, you just launched Omnia. Well, you know, we just feel like it's really important to have Bluetooth low energy audio in the market as fast as possible so that people aren't buying hearing aids that won't have it. Well, in, in, in fact, I could see that uh, the Nexia carries over the Omnia speech and noise system because, I mean, it's really, it was only last year, yeah. which makes perfect sense. And then you add uh, Oracast and LE Audio to it. But what else is different between the Nexia and the Omnia? Yeah, you know, there's a few things. Um, you know, size and hearing aid continues to matter. Um, and so one of the things that we have worked on is a new micro receiver in the ear. And and so if you if you look at our current receiver in the airline, we have a standard product, and then we have a mini product, and and then we have uh, this new micro product. The, the new micro product is twenty five percent less size 
than the standard product, and even 16% less size than our micro product or than our uh, mini product. So this micro is it's tiny, um, but it even has the same battery in it. And it's got the same sound processing and a few new things in the hardware. So we have a we have an accelerometer in there today. So you'll be able to just kind of tap twice, uh, not right. You, know, you can do it by your hearing aid or, or right on your hearing aid, and you will be able to answer your phone uh, using the accelerometer. So that's that's new in there as well. But it has all of the sound processing, uh, you know, that we had before. Plus, we're adding a cross. Uh, across hearing aid, uh, Resound has not, or GN in general has not had a had a cross hearing aid, and so we're adding one. We're very proud of this one. It will be the smallest and has a really uh, really low noise floor, so it's a really nice uh, cross hearing aid with 16 hours of, of streaming uh, with with that battery. So it's a it's a really nice uh, cross hearing aid. We'll add, and then we're also adding um, in terms of signal processing. A new onboarding uh, prescriptive method. So it's called first time user onboarding. And it's just uh, another way to get new users comfortable with hearing aids as they as they start out. And and we wanted we've been a company that gives a little bit more high frequency uh, gain or so you know we turn up the high frequencies a little bit more for first time users than some other companies. And sometimes first time use, users comment, you don't really like that tinny sound quality and such like that, even though they need it. Um, that's what you have to have to hear a noise is ultimately get those uh, get those consonant sounds heard. Uh, but it is nice to start in a place where you can get used to that sound um, and then gradually be increased into into what you need for good speech understanding. So anyway, there's a lot a lot with Nexia, a lot in addition to uh, to that Bluetooth low energy audio and orcast. You actually forgot one, and that's the waterproof design with a IP68 rating. And, you know, it's it's funny because there are things you don't think they're important until you try it. Uh, because I'm wearing IP68 hearing aids. I've had them for about a year and a half, and I literally had them for a week, maybe two, uh, when my spouse and I went down to Florida, beach vacation. And, of course, I'm going to go wear them out in the Gulf of Mexico. And... I'm out there talking to her, talking to other people standing around me, and I could hear what they said. It was actually hard when you had to take your hearing aids out to go in the water. Yeah. And not to mention, I mean, the usual things like getting caught out in the rain if you wear running, you know, you get caught out in the rain, that sort of thing, which I've done like a million times. But yeah. uh, there are times when you're going to be around moisture of one kind or another and you want to hear well. So I think that's actually an understated feature that I'm glad to see coming to more and more hearing aids. Yeah, we actually have been IP68 uh, for a couple of hearing aids now. And, you know, it, it's fun because you you go into a training audiologist and you take a hearing aid that's working and just dump it in a glass of water for the whole training. And then, okay, let's see if the, my hearing aid still works and pull it out, put in a new battery, works just fine. You know, it's... Uh, you know, they, the, these coatings, these nano coatings really, they've changed uh, a lot of things, uh, including, uh, you know, something that I love to do is backpack and, and be outside and hiking and those things. It completely changed uh, that industry as well for sports and, and and being out in inclement weather. Hearing aids have benefited from those kind of coatings. So they really have been game changers for, for many things for people. Yeah, absolutely. So you have all these features of the Omnia and the Nexia, and yet they're smaller, and you've added LA Audio and a couple of other things as well. And the battery life I saw was listed as being 20 hours when streaming half the time. Yeah. And even more if you're streaming less. Uh, that's actually pretty impressive. It also implies that you've got some headroom to further raise the bar on the performance level. Uh, in what direction do you actually see those improvements coming? You can take advantage of the small size and the longer than necessary battery life uh, for all day wear, what performance improvements do you put that back into? Yeah, you know, anytime you have, you know, you, we, we want those kinds of battery life so that we can run a chip with a lot of processing power and do, do the kind of signal processing that we want. You know, I think as we look toward the future, um, what we and every hearing aid company wants is smaller rechargeable batteries. Um, 
you know, we we have rechargeable custom hearing aids on the market today, and they're you know they're they're larger than most people would want. You know, we we can't really make a true ITC, a true in the canal, um, unless you have a larger canal size. So, yeah, you, we're we're still making you know maybe bigger custom products than a lot of people would like, and we would like to get those down and have rechargeable you know in the ear products. So we look at those, but I think you know you look at the you know, the signal processing, you know, going back to that, you you want your hearing aid to be able to, you know, run a very high performance chip, you know, that, that's doing all of the processing, you know, that that we want to do. And, you know, I'll I'll go to our to our hearing and noise. You know, it's something that um that I was around when when the whole story started in research. Um so at that point I was the the head of research in North America. And um and I have just a wonderful colleague named Andrew Dipper. He he came from uh, University of Iowa. He uh, was a, a grad with Ruth Bentler. Um, he and uh, he and Todd Ricketts graduated, I think, together. Uh, and Todd, of course, has become quite a good uh, hearing aid researcher, well known at Vanderbilt. Uh, but Andy Andy came into our research team at GN. And I can remember where I was standing when Andy came up to me and said, you know, Laurel, we really need to do monovision and hearing aids. And, and I looked at him and go, what the heck is monovision? And he goes, that's that deal where you put, you know, a contact lens in for vision for far, and you put another one in for vision for close up and, and your brain just adapts to it. And you feel like you are looking in the distance with both eyes and up close with both eyes. And, and he goes, I think we need an omnidirectional hearing aid on full time for people to hear around and we need a directional hearing aid on full time for people to hear in noise. And, and he said, and, and, and I kind of did look at him and, and I'm coming from automotive research at this point, And I was developing directional microphones at automotive research. And, and I felt like we had climbed this mountain to get audiologists to even fit directional microphones at that time. And I'm like, Oh, and now we're going to go tell people you only need one in one ear. And Andy was like, you only do need one in one ear, Laurel. And and this really, this started a just a plethora of research. Um, Brian Walden, who was um, at Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital at the time, um, was probably the the person who, who grabbed onto it the most and said, this is the right thing to do. And he, you know, he was doing hearing aid fittings with veterans and, and he, you know, sent them out with, you know, all these counterbalanced memories, but ultimately had them test whether or not they liked hearing aids set with both hearing aids directional, both hearing aids omni, or this asymmetric fitting with one directional and one omni. And and he actually had a journal and and yet, you know, the, the data was all of these journals and they would have to write down where they were, um, what they were listening to and which of those programs that they liked. They had no idea what was in those programs. And and what he found was that they liked the asymmetric fitting. They 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 loved that ability to get out some of the noise, but they liked the ability to hear around them. And then you saw, you know, cl- you saw labs like Ruth Bentler's lab and 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 Ben Hornsby, who was in Todd Ricketts labs, start to look at does the signal to noise ratio improvement um degradate if you only put one on versus two on? And the answer to that question was no. Um, you only needed one hearing aid set directional in order to have the same signal to noise ratio improvement. And the only case that wasn't, you know, the only place that wasn't the case was when 100% of the noise was in the back and 100% of the speech was in the front. And and so thus comes, you know, this asymmetric hearing. And we put it out in a product um, called Azure. I mean, we're talking decade, you know, more than 15, 16 years ago. And, and we have, and we didn't even have ear to ear processing at that time. We had one was Omni and one was directional. Three of the years, we have a very sophisticated system now where using ear to ear, um, you as the, the hearing aid user in a quiet environment, you'd be in Omni directional. And then if you get into noise and we can detect some speech in the background, we will turn on the directional microphone on the side with the most noise. And that starts to take out that noise. 
if if the noise changes and it goes to the other side, we'll turn on that one and we'll put the other one on Omni. And then we will turn on both hearing aids to directional when we can detect the speech in the front and the noise in the back, which happens maybe 4% of the time. It's it's very little. And so in uh, on the hearing aid and and in the app, you can actually turn both of them on yourself if you want that just little extra added boost and you know what you are hearing is to the front. And and really, this has revolutionized how people listen in noise. And and now you're seeing other manufacturers do this. Um, you're seeing other manufacturers advertise that you can hear around and 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 you can hear around while hearing in noise. And you know, we've we've definitely been the pioneer. Um at the point where we are today with Nexia, we are using all four microphones on the two hearing aids to create a really narrow beam on the directional side. So incredibly good directionality, and and our engineers have have learned to, uh, you know, what the they've learned to really sample what the noise looks like in a more, in, you know, in a better way. So we have a higher resolution when we cancel noise. Uh, and and the higher resolution has ultimately brought us to almost 90 b signal to noise ratio improvement in the Lexia. So it it's it's astounding, and it's been uh, a journey that we've been on for for many many years. Every we've had to have a different chip. We had to have chips that did different things, um, different microphone inputs, and ear to ear. And so over the years, we've kind of just built on this until the culmination of the of the hearing and noise system that we have today. So so really when when I think about Nexi, I guess the way the way I would summarize it is is that you're you're really you're ticking the box in the real world by providing uh, the best speech and noise enhancement you know how to do and continuing to develop along that line and also the the best virtual experience now through LE Audio and Oracast connectivity. So I really appreciate you coming on to explain all that. Uh, as we wrap it up, any other uh, last thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I would mention one thing that's kind of in the back of my mind. Um, we we actually, in a product, a couple of products ago, put out uh, a new receiver called Marie, and it's called, it's microphone and, uh, you know, microphone and receiver in ear is what Marie stands for. But the, the Marie receiver is just a new receiver that has a microphone in the ear. Um, so it's hard to develop because the receiver and the microphone are right next to each other causing, you know, feedback, but we've done a very good job, um, with, with the fitting range for this, you know, you got to stick to the fitting range of the Marie receiver, uh, but the Marie receiver for the right people actually, um, gives great sound quality because you're, you have the acoustics of your own ear, uh, when, when you speak, because you're listening with the microphone in the ear in all omnidirectional settings. And in, in directional, we turn off the microphone in the ear and we use the, the microphones on top of the hearing aids. So it's a really unique way to hear. Sound quality is even better, especially for new users. They don't, you know, they don't get that weird feeling because we've always had to build an acoustic pinna your your pin acoustics back into the to the microphones up on the top uh, and we don't have to do that when you're listening with your own ear so great sound quality the microphones inside the ear so you have a really good wind noise reduction uh, we found that uh, you, you talked about listening effort earlier we found that uh, listening effort is less with people when they're listening to this microphone uh, so this Marie receiver has really been well received and um, and NAL, the National Acoustics Laboratory in Australia, just did a series of studies on um, this receiver and, and and actually just put it out publicly. It was on Australian TV today. Um, so it was kind of nice. a great to talk about it, but really talk about the benefits uh, to this receiver. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't say, hey, Nexia also takes that receiver. Um, so you can have that uh, that receiver with the microphone in the ear uh, along with a standard receiver, so and not everyone is a candidate for this Marie receiver, but it's also one thing that uh, I should mention that is part of Nexia. So for all the people listening now, the next hour of this podcast will be about the head-related transfer function. 
and what it takes to replicate that in a hearing aid or an earbud. <laughs> and you completely get this, Andrew, because that is exactly what it took um, and exactly why we decided that we wanted to have that in there. And, you know, with the with the with the extended bandwidth and having the microphone in the ear like that, patients that don't have too much high frequency hearing loss actually do hear the sound where it originates, which is not common with the hearing aid fitting. Most people with hearing aid fittings hear the sound kind of in front of them. And if you're wearing the Marie, um, I've had patients just look at me and go, oh my gosh, I hear you where you are instead of, you know, in my head. So it, it's it's amazing what you can do uh, with technology if you also know how the normal ear works. And we've got some incredible uh, researchers and and technology people who can make these things happen. So it's fun. I mean, I told you at the beginning, I wanted to be in the development part of it. You know, it's not me developing these things. There are 400 engineers and researchers who who do these, but in, you know, I'm lucky to be a part of it. Well, that's really terrific. And like I said in the beginning, your very background, I'm, I'm sure brings a lot to GN in the sense that you can serve as the voice of the customer between end users, hearing care professionals, and the development community. Uh, I suspect there are going to be people who want to reach you about aspects of this conversation. How would they do that if they would like to? Yeah, so I'm easy to reach at L. Christensen, and it's a T E N S E N. So it's that Christensen um, at gnresound.com. Terrific. Well, thanks for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you in person at Yuga in a couple of weeks, too. Sounds good. I look forward to it as well. And thanks for everyone uh, for watching or listening to this edition of This Week in Hearing.